Okay, just verifying you can see one slide right now. So, Lori, shake your head yes or no? Yes. Okay, all set to go then. Okay, I, as most of you guys know, I'm Steve Shea. I'm a member of a number of philatelic societies. Uh, I'm the secretary of USCS. I live in California, and I'm a member of our local chapter that's called the USS Saginaw chapter. We're going to talk about VG, VJ Day in Tokyo Bay today. So let's start off with what was VJ Day? Well, Victory Over Japan Day. It's a day in which Imperial Japan surrendered uh, in World War II, effectively ending World War II. Uh, marked as August 15th by Great Britain and other countries, because that was the date in local time that the announcement of Japan, Japan's surrender was made. It's pretty much marked as September 2nd in the United States, because that's the date in local time that in, in Japan that the surrender documents were actually signed. A little bit of a humorous story to go along with that. I have a Tokyo Bay exhibit, and some of the covers you'll see in this uh, presentation are in that exhibit. And my title on those pages was VJ Day. And the judge says, I'm sorry, but uh, you're wrong. September 2nd was not VJ Day, it was August 15th. And so I asked him, you know, all those cachets on those covers are all wrong. The Navy had it wrong. And he didn't have a good answer for that. And he actually emailed me a couple of weeks later and he says, I apologize. I can see September 2nd really was VJ Day celebrated in the U.S. that way. So learning, learning point for both of us. And as I said, VJ Day actually ended World War II. So just to give you a little history before we talk covers, leading up to VJ Day was, you know, June 1945, just a few months before the Battle of Okinawa had ended. And most of us are historians, so we know that was a pretty bad battle. 80,000 American casualties, 20,000 killed, a couple hundred thousand Japanese people killed. And as David Bernstein presented in a presentation uh, last year about uh, ships damaged by kamikazes, there were a lot of uh, Allied naval ships that were either damaged or sunk during this battle. So not a good sign of things to come. And I'm sure if you were in the Navy or Armed Services at that time, you, you weren't looking forward to what may be coming after Okinawa. And what was coming in the planning stage was something called Operation Downfall the invasion of the Japanese home islands. It was going to start in November 45 with an invasion of uh, Kyushu, which is the southernmost island in Japan, going to feature 450 Allied naval ships, 14 US Army divisions. So this is gonna be a big deal. Followed up by the following year, March 46, Operation Coronet, with the invasion of Honshu, the large Japanese island, 45 army divisions. And they were anticipating 863,000 casualties by early 1947. Now at the end of July, the allies called for the unconditional surrender of Japan. And Japan did not reply favorably. They said, we're not surrendering. They wanted terms, we didn't want to give them terms. So stalemate. August 6th and August 9th, we dropped the atomic bombs on Japan. Awful lot of people died. You can see the numbers there. And that convinced Japan, hey, time to <laughs> throw in the towel. We're gonna surrender. And they, they made that statement on August 15th. On August 15th, General Douglas MacArthur was named the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers. And Operation Blacklist was implemented. Blacklist was the name of the operation the Army proposed describing what we would do when we occupied Japan. Uh, Navy had a plan called Operation Campus for their plans for what would happen when we occupied Japan. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, we're gonna pick Blacklist Blacklist was an army proposal. MacArthur became the Supreme Commander. Somewhere after August 15th, 
and the name is lost to history, or at least to my knowledge. Somebody authorized Navy ships to develop cachets and print them or stamp them on mail and authorize the use of modifying or making new cancellations that would could include the location name of Tokyo Bay and could include the ship name. The intent was to let the world know where the ship and crew were, something of a celebration. Obviously, all these people now did not have to look forward to the invasion of Japan. Mail still had to be censored until BJ Day. After that, no censoring. And with that authorization is kind of how we, as collectors, got into collecting Tokyo Bay covers. Little refresher. During the war, we had, in essence, mute cancels. They would say US Navy, or there's what we call a type two pound, which said US Navy and listed a branch number, with that branch being a number assigned either to a ship or a location. But they didn't include the ship name, didn't include anything about the location of where this location, uh, the ship was. So with the proclamation from whoever the somebody was, we could now see modified cancellations as in the top one type P, P standing for provisional. They took a type two pound cancel and added the words Tokyo Bay in the killer. Or we could see some type Fs, Fs standing for fancy. And while this one is a fancy cancel, not all are fancy, but they are non-standard cancellations. And a little bit of a geography lesson. This is a map of the Tokyo area, Tokyo Bay area. Uh, Sagami Bay is sort of in the middle of the map. That's where the fleet first sailed into before they went into uh, Tokyo Bay. They sailed in there on August 27th. You can see a little bit to the right of that where the Missouri was anchored within Tokyo Bay during the surrender ceremony. And my right hand arrow just points out Tokyo Bay and then the arrow up about one o'clock is pointing out where Tokyo is in relation to all this. And if you look over about nine o'clock in the green circle, you can see Mount Fuji. And as you'll see in many of the caches used on these covers, Mount Fuji figured very prominently. This is actually a picture I took of Sagami Bay. I was in Japan on business in 2017, visiting a town called Kamakura. Some of my uh, colleagues at work took me there. There's a huge Buddha statue, uh, largest in the world, if I remember correctly. And we were visiting that and I looked out over the water and took this picture, not even understanding where I was at the time. Uh, later, I looked at a map trying to figure out where in the world I'd been and I learned this was Sagami Bay. So I've actually seen that. So it's kind of interesting to me. As I mentioned, the first ships arrived August 27th, and that's actually when the first caches and cancellations went into use. But today we're only gonna talk se September 2nd. And so a little bit of information about September 2nd. There were 255 allied ships in Tokyo Bay at the time. They weren't all US Navy. You can see them listed, the US Navy, Great Britain Navy, Maurice, Australian Navy, Dutch Navy, Army ships, US Merchant Marine ships, and Great Britain Merchant Marine ships. Part of the reason for having so many ships and demonstrating so much power was Japanese propaganda had told all their citizens that the US Navy had been totally destroyed. So MacArthur said, we're going to show them we weren't destroyed. I'm gonna have a lot of ships there. Uh, an interesting thing about all this is a comparison of MacArthur to Eisenhower. When VE Day, victory over Europe occurred in Europe and the German surrender was signed, Eisenhower wasn't even present. He chose not to be present. Very low key ceremony, signatures were done, surrender was done and over with. MacArthur, quite the opposite, as you'll see in the presentation, but it started off with 255 ships. Judges have also asked me 
questions about the scarcity in my covers and when I do exhibiting. So I thought I thought I would address this a little bit with you guys. We all have a postmark catalog from the USCS, and most of the postmarks you're going to see today are rated Bs and Cs, which is limited and scarce. But that just tells what the postmark is. It doesn't tell anything about the date. And as you're going to see, every cancel in this presentation is dated September 2nd. Think about the mailings that went on on that date. And you can think about crew sizes, and I've listed three types of ships and approximate crews. Did all those people on the crew mail something that day? Did half the complement of the ship mail something? Did they all mail two things that day? Totally unknown questions. I, I don't know. But logically, I can say, well, there's probably more covers from a battleship than there are in attack transport just because of crew size. But I don't know. It makes it very hard to say how scarce the covers are. And then who do they mail them to? As you'll see in this presentation, they were often going to family, to friends. So how many of those family and friends kept those covers over the years? Again, a very big unknown. And then how much survives today? I, I don't know. A judge actually asked me, if I had a census of all the Tokyo Bay covers, and I wouldn't even know how about going, how to go about doing such a thing. So now we're gonna talk covers. We're gonna talk more about the US fleet, more than just the US fleet, but I wanted to include this. This is actually the title page of a Frank Hope Tokyo Bay exhibit from about 20 years ago. And somebody hand drew this, which it's, Pretty neat. I just have always liked it, but I've never been able to use it for anything. So I thought I would show it today. And now we'll start with a cover. I have class uh, grouped the covers by ship type. So the first ship type we're going to look at are attack, attack transport ships. And this cover has a lot going on with it. And that's part of the reason I lead off with it. It's got the fancy cancel. September 2nd, USS Botatort, certainly not a standard cancel. That's why we call it a Type F. It has a cachet, and there's Mount Fuji, as I mentioned, would show up in a lot of cachets. There's wording on the cachet, which is kind of interesting, and the new bomb helped us too. Well, obviously, this had to have been made after August 9th, so somebody, again, Somebody authorized things, somebody put some artwork together, somebody <laughs> made a rubber stamp all within a couple of weeks after uh, Japan and announced their surrender. The corner card in this one's very interesting. It's from an RV private. It says he's with the GHQ, which is the general headquarters. Uh, down in the right-hand corner, I have the patch that he would have worn as a soldier previously known as General Headquarters of the Southwest Pacific, which was MacArthur's command. Now the Southwest Pacific was deleted, just uh, General Headquarters. And it says this sender was with the Recovered Personnel Department, or detachment rather. That would be our POWs. So our ships were in there early in Tokyo Bay and trying to kept, get all of the POWs back into our control and on hospital ships and so on and so forth. Uh, the ships that sailed to Tokyo Bay weren't there just for a show. They were landing troops, as in this case, and in many cases, they were there no more than a couple of days, and they left to go get more troops. And this is an example. This ship left Tokyo Bay two days later after landing troops on the third. Another transport, Briscoe, a printed cachet, talking about Victory Day versus VJ Day, but same meaning. And they used a standard cancellation. And this one was censored. Um, remember I said after September 2nd, covers wouldn't have to be censored. You'll note that some of mine are, some of mine aren't. My theory on that is perhaps some of the letters are written on the first, and they got censored on the first, even though they were mailed on the second. Perhaps regulations weren't clearly known by everybody, or maybe it was just a habit that everybody tossed their letters into the censoring bin and they got censored. 
I'm not really sure which. This one's a little tattered, but another transport. This was carrying members of the 8th Army, which would be taking over the occupation of Honshu, and specifically members of the 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, the 1st Cavalry Division would actually be in Japan for five years in occupation duty. This one's got a Type P cancel. They added the words Tokyo Bay to the cancel, and it's got a very nice two-color cachet. So it took a little bit of work to make that and stamp it properly on an envelope. USS Cecil actually had two cancels we can see. Top cancel is a Type F, very fancy. And then the bottom one is a Type P. They modified one of their two Z cancels. Uh, the top cover has a cachet from the ship, noting it was in Tokyo. Uh, the bottom cover is somebody used a patriotic themed uh, envelope. Patriotics were very popular during the war. And this guy probably just had one in his pile of envelopes to use and he used it that day. And this is what those types of ships look like. This is specifically the USS Cecil. Uh, these, ship carried, these ships carried troops. This one carried about 1,200 Army troops. Another transport, the Lenawi, fancy cancel. This one's noting BJ Day, also carrying troops from the 1st Cavalry Division. Missoula. Nothing special in the cancel, but they made themselves a cachet, noting VJ Day. Uh, this one, if you happen to look at the letter N in the word original and landing, <laughs> you can see the N's are backwards. I don't know if that's because the guy had a hard time doing a mirror image because you have to carve the stamp as a mirror image or whether he was dyslexic or whether it was done on purpose. But it, I caught my eye that they're backwards. Uh, this is another one of those ships offloaded troops on the third. They left on the fourth. Rutland, they used two cancels in this case, uh, regular 2Z, but they also had a straight line um, cancel. It's reading <clears throat> USS Rutland, US occupation, Tokyo Bay, Japan. And this sender uh, commander may well have been the commander of that ship. And you can see he wrote under the stamp, this was a surrender date. And he sent it to another commander, probably a friend of his. USS St. Mary's has a nice cachet. <clears throat> there was a Saint USS St. Mary's in 1850. And then another one during World War II. This is the only cachet I've ever seen signed by one of the sailors who created it. I can't read his signature other than noting it starts with an S and ends with an N. Uh, another judge once asked me why I wasn't noting all the names of the cachet makers in my exhibit. Well, I think that would be nigh on impossible to figure out at this point in time, but he thought I should be doing that. Another ship that left on the 4th after landing 1st Cavalry troops. Two covers from the Highlands. Uh, the top one is the only cover I've ever seen with this cachet. Uh, map of Japan, hand colored. Uh, the guy typed in at Tokyo Bay on BJ Day, and he noted <laughs> that it was 7,997 miles to the uh, addressee in Clinton, Massachusetts, which is kind of neat. Uh, the bottom is a postcard, which are fairly unusual. I don't see too many BJ Day cards as postcards. Uh, another cover, this is the only example I've ever seen for the dolphin. Um, nice cachet, denoting that the uh, ship arrived with the 12th Cavalry Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division of the 8th Army. And uh, at the bottom, I noted the distinctive insignia used by the 12th Cavalry Regiment, as well as the shoulder sleeve insignia of the 1st Cavalry. And the cachet is a modified Type 9. Uh, added the words Tokyo Bay Area. Talladega used a, actually a printed a cancel. This is probably uh, an envelope run through a stencil machine or a hectograph type machine. Um, 
actually is pretty fancy with all the wavy lines denoting uh, Tokyo Bay and occupation force. Uh, this ship also was carrying first cavalry troops. Another transport, Clearfield, modified their cancel to show Tokyo Bay and a nice VJ Day uh, cachet. USS Dark used a fairly simple, but it's a Type F cachet, uh, cancel rather, Tokyo Bay VJ Day, September 2nd. Uh, a nice drawing on this cachet from the USS Dickens. Uh, you can see Mount Fuji and what looks like maybe a Hellcat flying over a city, and you can see a bomb explosion down there, and they've noted it's Tokyo Bay exclamation park. Exclamation point, VJ Day. Lavaca, they actually had two cachets for some reason. Uh, the cancel is very much a type F, circular USS Lavaca, Tokyo Bay. Uh, you see a cow in each cachet. Lavaca means cow in Spanish. So I guess that was probably a nickname or a uh, mascot or something like that. But both cachets denote Tokyo Bay, September 2nd. Uh, this ship was carrying troops of the 41st Division, the 148th Field Artillery Battalion, in fact, is what the cinder was on the lower cover. So we know it was an Army troop, Trooper uh, Technician 5, as he wrote in his corner card. I had this cover several years, and I wasn't able to figure out what uh, ship this came from. It obviously came from Amphibious Group 12. The cancellation just simply tells us it's a ship in Tokyo Bay, but it took me a while, and I did some research recently on Google and found out that this was the USS Hansford. And I looked up the cancellation on our catalog, and the cancellation matched, so now I've been able to identify this ship and they were landing troops also. This cover is from a ship USS Gasconade. They are not listed as being in Tokyo Bay for the surrender ceremony. And that's because the ship actually arrived after the ceremony, but on the second. And so you can see their cancel still says September 2nd, they were there. Uh, their cachet says they're Tokyo Bay, they were there. It's just they came in after the ceremony, so you won't see them on the official list of ships being there. Uh, they, this ship was carrying uh, members of the 11th Corps. And one last transport, the USS Sheridan. Um, and just to kind of keep things in perspective, there were 21 attack transports one plane transport, nine attack cargo ships, 13 LSMs, eight LSTs, nine LCIs, and two LSDs all present on September 2nd in the ships in the bay. And of course, all these ships would have been landing troops, equipment, and supplies for the occupation. Can I ask a question, Steve? Uh, guess you can. How, how, how did you determine what units were on these various ships? Uh, research using DANFs for the most part. Okay. I mentioned a transport ship on the previous slide. This was the transport ship, USS General S.D. Sturgis. Uh, very nice cachet, noting a VJ day, September 2nd. This is what I would call a souvenir. It's not addressed to anybody. It probably never went through the mail. But this lieutenant commander who says he was in the medical corps aboard the ship wanted it for himself is my guess. So he just had it stamped and kept it for himself as a souvenir. This ship is interesting. It sailed out of Manila with the off with many high ranking officers and officials uh, from Australia, Canada, Netherlands, East Indies, China and the Philippines, bringing them to the surrender ceremony. And now we're going to leave covers for a minute. We're going to talk a little bit about what was happening on BJ Day. We probably all in this presentation know USS Missouri was the site of the surrender. Here's a photo of the 
Missouri, and you can see a bunch of little launches in the foreground. These would have been launches taking people to the Missouri for the ceremony. And Missouri was selected somewhat at Truman's prompting because Missouri was Truman's home state. Uh, the ship was anchored very close to where Commodore Perry ships had anchored way back in 1853. And the ceremony was going to be started at 9 a.m. So there were some early wake up calls that day. And the first, um, first ship USS Taylor took 170 press agents to the Missouri at 707 a.m. that morning. This is an overhead shot showing the Buchanan. Buchanan took a number of general officers of the Navy and some foreign representatives to the ship. They arrived at 803 and you can see how close the Buchanan was to the Missouri. At 838, the destroyer Nicholas arrived bringing MacArthur to the ship. Now we'll leave that for a minute. We'll get back to the Missouri, but let's look at some more covers right now. There were some cargo attack ships, USS Libra, nice cachet mount featuring uh, Mount Fuji. And interestingly, this cancel is a type three, which you may recognize from being in use prior to World War II. So they just simply put Tokyo Bay in the killer bars to say, hey, this is where we're at. USS Medea. A somewhat generic cachet. Uh, you actually saw this cachet on the Sheridan. You, you'll see it on at least one or two more covers. Uh, the cancel is a printed cancel. It actually was run through a printing press to put the cancel on. And then since it doesn't touch the stamp, uh, the mail clerk actually kind of hid the dial and used the killer bars of the cancel to actually make the cancellation on the stamp. USS Pamina. See the same cachet and what looks like the same cancel, but interestingly enough, as I looked at this, you put the two side by side and you actually can see they're a little bit different. And the easiest way to see they're different is looking at the word Tokyo and the dial. On the bottom, they're very squared off O's and on the top, they're very round O's. So they had different printings on these two ships to make very similar looking uh, cancellations. USS Serona took their type two, P, two pound cancel and inserted September 2nd in Tokyo Bay in different font to show where they were with a nice little cachet. And here's a postcard. Again, I said postcards are fairly unusual. Uh, this one is actually Japanese postcard as you can see. So my guess is this sailor made it onto land, probably in the Yokohama area, probably in early, you know, late August, August 27th, 8th, 9th, or 30th, or September 1st, scrounged him up a postcard somewhere and used it to mail a postcard back to somebody he knew in Brooklyn. This is also unusual and it wasn't mailed air mail, it was mailed for free servicemen could do that. And um, the face of the postcards in the lower right, it's a scene of uh, some mining operation in Japan. This is what I call the king of the cancels. The winged Tokyo Bay cancel is the biggest cancel I think I've ever seen. Um, also used a standard type 2Z cancel to cancel this one. Another cover, USS Tallinn, and again, this is the only time I've ever seen this cover. Very nice, attractive cachet and even made more attractive by somebody doing some hand coloring. And there's Mount Fuji with the rising sun in the background. The white side, kind of the opposite, not a very good cachet. Looks like maybe a little milium block or something like that, not real sharp. Printing is not real good, but still you can see the ship and read Tokyo Bay. And they had a little circular dial reading Tokyo Bay kind of used as a cancellation. Another one of those ships that unloaded troops and was gone by the 4th. 
USS Hollis, a high speed transport, uh, attractive cache, and again, very more attractive because somebody took the time to hand color it. Uh, you can see a Japanese chop on the left hand side. So I would say this person probably also got into town, stole a chop from a shop or something like that, and used it to apply to this cache. Uh, this particular under de underwater demolition team were tasked with clearing the docks at Yokosuka and hunting for two-man submarines and kamikazes. So you can imagine they were kind of busy once they got on land. William J. Patterson, a nice VJ day, Tokyo Bay, Japan, and the killer bars, and a somewhat nice cache. And there were some battleships. A pre-war battleship, USS Idaho, using a Type 3 cancel, and a printer cache denoting there were the uh, USS New Mexico, Mississippi, Idaho, all in Tokyo Bay on this date. And some of them from the Mississippi also used the same cache and their old Type 3 cancel. And then we're going to go back to the Missouri here for a few slides. Here's a nice shot of the Missouri on a VJ day. You can see all the sailors in their whites. You get an idea of how close the ships were. Some of the ships, you can see them to the left of the Missouri in this photo. And here is a postcard. Running vertically in the postcard, you can see it says processed by the USS Missouri print shop. So this was printed on board. Uh, one side has the text about the greetings and how we've reached their zenith of our triumphs, et cetera, et cetera. The other side has a picture of a saddle. And you can see the saddle says Halsey on it, but I didn't understand what the significance of this saddle was. A little bit of research led me to learn that Back in March of 45, Halsey was asked at a press conference, conference if he thought the uh, palace of uh, the Japanese emperor should be a military target. And in Halsey's style, he said, I hate to have them kill the hero Hito's white horse because I want to ride it. <laughs> well, the Reno, Nevada Chamber of Commerce hooked up on that. And so they told their citizens during a war bond drive that if we meet our quota of bonds, we're going to pay to make a saddle for Halsey. Well, they met their goal. Reno made a very fancy saddle, as you can see. It was completed only in early August. It was displayed for a while in a town a shop called Boots and Butler in Reno. And then Japan announced its intention to surrender. Well, they sent the saddle to a Marshall Field store in Chicago. That store only had a couple of days to take some photos of it, and then they sent it to Halsey. So this thing got on an airplane, went from Chicago, eventually to Guam, loaded aboard the USS Catamount. That took it into Tokyo Bay, and they gave it to Halsey on board the Missouri. Thus, the saddle on the postcard. And just in case you're wondering, Halsey never did ride the Emperor's white horse. And this saddle still exists today. It's uh, on display in Reno somewhere. Another Missouri cover, very clean. You can read the cancellation very well. Uh, you can see this is from a sailor to a master, Leon Jettison. Uh, that tells me it's probably a kid because it's care of Mr. and Mrs. Jettison. And there's a letter inside saying it was mailed uh, with a splendid surrender ceremony cancellation on it. This will be a memorable day for us on board. I'm proud to be here. It was a long, hard road to Tokyo Bay, but we're here. Kind of a neat little insert. And one more Missouri cover, uh, cache denoting the four stars of Halsey. This is his flagship as a commander of the Third Fleet. And this one's mailed by a chaplain who was on board, uh, sent to a reverend at the University of Detroit. 
Uh, Halsey transferred his flag back to the USS uh, South Dakota on the 5th, and the uh, Missouri left Tokyo Bay on the 6th, she, so she wasn't there very long. Battleship New Mexico, um, you can see from the cache, it's actually a printed photo taken sometime just before uh, BJ Day, it shows Mount Fuji in the background. And we have a British ship, HMS Duke of York, battleship that was in Tokyo Bay. Uh, these are not very common. I've only seen a few of these. And if you wondered what this ship looked like, it's a good looking, sharp looking battleship. USS West Virginia. There were two ships in Tokyo Bay that were at Pearl Harbor on December 7th this being one of them. Uh, you may probably know the story, West Virginia was sunk, but raised, repaired, and lo and behold, on September 2nd, she was in Tokyo Bay. Very attractive cachet, someone hand colored it, making it more attractive, and a very fancy cancel, uh, denoting Tokyo Bay on September 2nd. You can see the cancel a little better on this cover, and at first glance, you may think that cache is the same as the one we just saw. I'll show you in a minute why it's a little different. And one more cover. Again, you may think it's the same cache. Uh, this particular cover had a ship's newsletter in it. A lot of ships did newsletters, and this one had, talks all about the history of West Virginia, the USS West Virginia. These are those three different caches. And they truly are different. If you look at them a little bit, you can notice some subtle differences. Uh, an easy one to see for me is the clouds to the left of Mount Fuji. On the upper right, it actually, uh, upper right cache, it actually looks like a little cloud to the left. But if you look on the other two caches, they're just squiggles. If you look at the ships sort of in the background, they're all a little bit different on each cache. Even the ship is a little bit different from cache to cache. And generally, if you kind of look at the clouds, you see some look like clouds, some look like squiggles. So interesting to me that the ship would have actually printed three different caches. And I don't know if that's because their hectograph stencil you know, went bad and they had to redraw and make another one, or I'm not, not really sure the reason, but uh, it, I think it's interesting. Oops, sorry about that. And a very nice hand painted one, styled very much after the printed cachets, but this is hand painted. Uh, again, you see Mount Fuji and the battleship in the foreground. There were some cruisers there, USS Boston. They changed their cancel and had a nice cachet, Mount Fuji. USS Chicago also change the cancel and show the ship name and the location. USS Quincy apparently used two different caches. Uh, the cancel is the same on each, but the caches are quite different. Uh, the bottom one, this is the only time I've ever seen this uh, cache. And again, it's much more attractive because somebody took the time to hand color it. USS St. Paul, very nice red printed cache, very nice fancy cancel, uh, sent by a guy apparently probably to his wife. And we had an Australian ship, HMAS Shropshire. Very nice cancel they, they used, let you know it's in Tokyo Bay on September 2nd, and then the rubber stamp official signing of the Japanese surrender. Again, not a very common cover. And here is the other ship that was at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, the USS Detroit. She used her old Type 3 and a new cache showing on Mount Fuji. USS Oakland, a little straight line cache, Type P cancel denoting Tokyo Bay. USS Pasadena, a very 
nice pictorial uh, cache, Mount Fuji with a cruiser in the foreground. Uh, the Wilkes Bear, three different caches. Uh, first is a printed up in the upper left hand sh showing a map of Japan and Tokyo Bay. Uh, lower right, we see a rubber stamp cache. And then the upper right, it looks like somebody took the time to hand draw that cache using green ink. So it's kind of a neat, probably a one of a kind envelope. And there were some escort carriers. And we, again, we have another British ship, USS Ruler, uh, HMS Ruler, sorry about that. Uh, the Ruler was built in the US, loaned to Great Britain. Uh, they returned the ship to the US in January 46, got accepted into the US Navy and was almost immediately decommissioned. Again, not a very common cover. And if the other was the king of cancels, I call this the queen of cancels just due to the size. Great big old word, Tokyo, kind of behind a cancel. Uh, escort carrier USS Salamua. And here is what that ship looked like. There were a lot of destroyers present. Start with the USS Mayo. Uh, again, this is the only time I've seen this cachet, uh, used an old type three cancel denoting Tokyo Bay and someone hand colored in into the uh, cachet making it more attractive. And this one's a pretty fancy one in my opinion. It's a two, two color uh, cachet, two, two rubber stamps probably used a magenta and then a black and then a very fancy nice cancel Tokyo Bay September 2nd, Surrender Day. It's the only example of this cache I've ever seen. USS Madison, kind of an ugly cover and not very fancy, but does say anchored in Tokyo Bay. USS Wallace L. Lind, mailed from a captain, says he was on the staff secretary uh, carrier task force mailed to another captain in Rio de Janeiro. And this is what the Wallace L. Lend looked like. Another what I call a souvenir cover. This was not addressed to anybody. It's postmarked, but it never went through the mail. Somebody wanted a souvenir and they got a very nice one and they hand colored the cache and in my opinion is a beautiful cache but it's a souvenir. Uh, this ship also is not among the 255. Uh, Norman Scott arrived after the ceremony, but certainly was present in Tokyo Bay on the 2nd. There were a few DEs there, USS Goss. Uh, looks like a letter being mailed home to the guy's wife, and a simple, simple cachet mailed in Tokyo Bay on Surrender Day. Another DE with a type F fancy cancel, USS Weaver. Uh, the Weaver assisted in evacuating uh, some of the prisoners of war that were uh, liberated in Japan, brought them back to the US. A mine layer, USS Thomas Fraser, no cache, but a, a type P cancel denoting Tokyo, Japan. Uh, this ship took part in uh, clearing some of the mines that uh, US forces had applied around Japan. Somebody had to do the work and somebody had to get the mines up and bring things back into use in the waterways. So this that was one of the tasks for this ship. Another souvenir cover, uh, never mailed, but somebody wanted it and kept it. USS Jeffers, nice cache, also part of the mine sweeping group. Uh, Subchaser, PCE R849, R standing for radar. Uh, you can see she had a cache, initial occupation, Tokyo. Uh, cancel doesn't say anything, but it does have a cache. Uh, this is a hand drawing of the ship that I have. You can see this wasn't a very large ship. You know, 96 was the uh, complement of the crew. 
So you can imagine there's probably not a lot of coverage from this ship, certainly not compared to a battleship that had 1,500 people on it. Seaplane tender, USS Hamlin, cute little cachet. And USS YMS 461, an auxiliary motor minesweeper. There were several of these in Tokyo Bay. Again, somebody had to do the work of sweeping mines and this was one of the ships. This is a photo of the ship, 461 being to the right and partially hidden by the other ship. This ship had a crew of 35. So there just can't have been a lot of mail from this ship on, the, on September 2nd. So I suspect that's a pretty rare cover that I just showed. There were some general communications vessels. Um, this is from the um, USS Mount Olympus. A very fancy cancel, um, a nice cachet. She notes, notes she was carrying some 8th Army troops of the 11th Corps, and uh, their insignias are both down at the bottom, shoulder sleeve insignias. Apparently used different colors on that day. The other one was uh, magenta, and now we have a blue cancel. Uh, this being mailed from a lieutenant to a lieutenant on the USS Nevada. Uh, you can see that this cover says inter-island. Well, what that means is while the mailing address for the Nevada was FPO San Francisco, don't take this letter all the way back to San Francisco and then come back into the Pacific to chase the Nevada because the Nevada is already in the Pacific somewhere. In fact, she was, she was in the Philippines. So this would have been taken directly to the Philippines. Uh, this ship also brought some first cavalry members to Japan for occupation. And one more from the ship because she apparently also used black ink for her cancel that day. Uh, this one's mailed from a lieutenant commander uh, in the army who was aboard the ship. And this is a picture of the ship. And this is our last cover, USS Teton, with a nice two-color cachet. And again, I, the two-color cachet has always kind of surprised me because they took some talent and extra effort to apply and get everything to register up properly. And a, a nice type P cancel. Now we're gonna go back to the Missouri. This is a picture aboard the Missouri. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see it flag. Looks like it's encased in glass. Interesting story on this too and somewhat related to showmanship. Uh, the Naval Academy had this flag. It's the flag the Commodore Perry flew over Tokyo Bay in 1853. And they had written Halsey saying, how would you like to fly this at the Japanese surrender? And Halsey said, yep, that's great. Let's do that. And so he wrote them back in late August and said, let's do that. August 23rd was when the Naval Academy got the note. They recruited an officer and they, they said, this is your duty, you're going to Tokyo, you're taking this flag. He was put on a plane less than two hours later, carrying the flag in a uh, briefcase. He was routed from the Naval Academy to Columbus, to Olathe, Kansas, Winslow, Arizona, San Francisco arriving the following day around 1.30. He was given some shots there and put aboard a plane for Pearl Harbor. Went to Pearl Harbor and he described it as being, even though it was a Navy plane, it was like a commercial airliner complete with food service being presented by waves, the women in the Navy. He arrived at Pearl after a 12 hour flight around 1.30 a.m. and was told his next flight would depart at 3 a.m. This time he got another, another uh, plane similar to the first, but this one had what he described as MacArthur seats, great big leather comfortable seats that he could sit in. That flight took him to Johnstone Island, arriving at 8 a.m. He had a quick breakfast, hopped another plane to Guam, 
after a stop in Kwajalein. Guam was a 10 hour flight. He made it to Guam, spent the night, flew to Iwo Jima, another type of plane. Then from Iwo Jima, he caught an army Catalina into Tokyo Bay, delivering to him to the Missouri. He arrived there around August 30th. So the guy had a few flights. And I can tell you he would have been jet lagged from personal experience. He met Halsey. He said, here's your flag. Halsey apparently took, showed him around the ship, showed him the saddle we talked about earlier. And when they took the flag out of the briefcase with the intent to fly it, there was a note in the briefcase saying, don't fly this because it would probably turn to shreds. You can enclose it in glass, which is what they did. And that's what you see here on the bulkhead of the Missouri is that flag. Now, was it all, all that worth the trouble? I don't know, but that's what they did. This is the ship. This is where the ceremony was. The Japanese representatives were headed by a foreign minister by the name of Mamamuro Shigemitsu, and they arrived at 8.56. You can actually see them up on the uh, deck about four or five o'clock in the kind of right-hand side of the photo. It's said that when the delegation was put aboard, one of the first questions they asked is, are all of these ships new? Because they were told, again, as I said earlier, the US Navy had been destroyed. So they assumed these must be new ships. Now well, that's propaganda for you. If you look at the turrets, in this picture, you can see they're swung somewhat to the right. That was done as a show of force because the Japanese delegation had to walk under them as they came aboard the ship. There was an honor guard down there and you can see them in the photo, but you can't really tell it, that everybody in the honor guard had to be over six feet tall. Again, a show of force for the delegation as they came aboard. And the last thing you can kind of see in this photo to take note of is you can see how cloudy it was that day. And here's Mr. General MacArthur here starting the ceremony at 902. The ceremony was only 23 minutes long. And he started it out by saying, it's my earnest hope, indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world should emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past, a world founded upon faith and understanding, a world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. The surrender documents are then going to be signed by representatives from nine nations and Japan, the US, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Netherlands, Soviet Union, China, Free French, and Canada would all sign it. And if you look behind MacArthur, you can see that front row of people. They are all the representatives from those different countries. Uh, what you can't see in the picture, but would be to the left, would have been Nimitz for the US and the Chinese uh, general. But you can see in the white shorts, Great Britain, then Soviet Union, uh, Dutch, uh, I believe New Zealand, France, uh, Australia, I believe, and the last, um, I think might be Canada. MacArthur signed first at 9.08 a.m. Behind him were General Rainwright and General Percival. These were the two generals that surrendered Corregidor and Singapore, respectively. Uh, they became POWs and were released, which I'm sure accounts for their haggard, thin looking appearances here. You can see that there are lots of officers being present here. Uh, among those officers, somewhat interestingly, was General Doolittle. And I'm sure you recognize his name from the Doolittle Raiders. He was the general in charge of the 8th Air Force in Europe. And you may wonder what the heck was he doing on the Missouri and Pacific in September. 
Remember, there were plans being made for the invasion of Japan before the Japanese surrendered. Doolittle and his boss, General Spots, were in the Pacific because they were scouting out things because the plan was to transfer the 8th Air Force from Europe to Japan to support that occupation. So Doolittle, the first to fly over Japan during the war, was present for the end of the war here. Here's a different shot. Uh, again, you can see, now you can see Nimitz in that first row and the Chinese general. Uh, interesting story on this table also. Several interesting stories about this whole ceremony. The British provided a mahogany table for the surrender ceremony. But as you can see by the documents, MacArthur signing there, the documents were bigger than the table. So there was a little bit of a scramble. Somebody went down to the cruise mess and several sailors carried up a large table to the deck and that became the surrender table. That's a tablecloth from the wardroom that's being used there. Well, after the surrender, sailors returned the table back to the cruise mess when somebody realized, you know, that's a pretty historic table. We shouldn't just put it in the cruise mess. And so they went and identified it and I believe that table exists somewhere today. This is Nimitz signing. He signed at 912. <clears throat> uh, you can see MacArthur and Halsey behind him with another admiral, I'm not sure who. Um, again, you can see how many officers were present. I can assure you there were a lot of stars on collars there that day. Admirals, commodores, generals, a lot of stars. Uh, at 929, by 929, the Japanese had signed and departed. So less than less than a half hour, this is all over. They had arranged for an overflight by the US airplanes. These planes came from carriers that were off the coast of Japan, and it came from B-29s. There were I see various numbers, but somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 airplanes flew over the fleet that day. Uh, again, I mentioned the clouds. It was very cloudy that day, and just about the time the planes were due to arrive, the sun broke through and the planes flew over. Very much like a Hollywood production, you couldn't have asked for anything better. And here's another shot of planes flying over the Missouri. If you were there, you were given a card. And this card says certifying the presence of, in this case, Annie Buchanan, but the formal surrender of the Japanese forces to the Allied powers. Kind of a neat thing, a neat souvenir. And again, these are not very common because most of these have gone by the wayside since 1945. After the ceremony, as I've mentioned, other ships arrived that day delivering troops and supplies. Ships would continue to use their special cachets and cancels all through September and even throughout 1945, but none of them would be canceling with September 2nd. Um, again, as noted, as soon as September 3rd, the very next day, some of the ships started departing. So that 255 started dwindling down. And of course, everybody was very happy that the war had ended. In case you weren't counting, you've just seen covers from 58 of the 255 ships that were there, plus two that arrived afterwards. In my opinion, none of these covers are common, even though they're even those that are from the largest ships with the largest crews. To me, they represent very true historical pieces. Even the souvenirs are historical in my opinion, and someone took the time and effort to save them all those years since 1945. And since this will be on YouTube, I always say if you like naval covers, go see www.uscs.org and check out our organization. Consider joining and enjoy what you collect and collect what you enjoy and have fun collecting. And with that, it's the end of the show.